Welcome to the Artist Advisory Hotline, the podcast for artists who want valuable guidance and honest answers on how to grow their careers and develop their new project from leading art world experts and artists. Here's your host and founder of the Artist Advisory, Marina Press Granger. Tune in as she gets you the answers you deserve. Hello, artists, and welcome to the Artist Advisory Hotline. I'm your host, Marina Granger. I have such a great episode today. We have gallerist Key Smith on the line, and he's going to give us some really wise advice. Now, how many of you are out there wondering how can you show in galleries when they don't accept submissions, right? And one of the you know, there's so many ways, there's so many answers to this. And Key is definitely going to enlighten us and give us some of those answers. But I got to tell you, you know, I worked in galleries in New York City for nearly 15 years before I started the artist advisory in 2018. And one of the most important tools that I teach artists and whoops there was a a text message that went through and you know and I gotta tell you I think it's like something very cosmic whenever I have something super important to share a siren goes off outside or a text message comes through so listen up one of the most important tools that I teach visual artists is how they can get galleries to actually approach them. And I do this inside the Artist Academy, which is pretty much a, like the ultimate professional development course for visual artists. I have taught this course now 11 times. I'm teaching it for the 12th time uh, starting at the end of this month. And I got to read some of these. Oh, I'm just got, I pulled up two emails from artists that are presently in the course that I received that I want to share with you just so, you know, uh, you can hear some of their successes and you can also tune back into like previous episodes of this podcast where I interview some graduates, but let me read this to you. So this is from one artist. Uh, who wrote to me two months into the course and said this, I do have some news. Just the other day, I got a call from an established a new gallery, like an established person opening up a new gallery in the Arts District area here, uh, which opens in March. He asked if I would show my work in the gallery and also offered me a solo show. We have a meeting to talk further on details. A gallery approaching me as a first. I have to think stepping up my presentation recently is why he approached me. Yeah, isn't that cool? Like to get a gallery to approach you. So this message is from one of the artists who is graduating from the Artist Academy this month, right? And one of the best things with the Artist Academy is I also invite at the very end, after we're done with all our coursework, I invite gallerists to meet the artists in the program and they really get to know each other. And from this, really amazing things have happened. There have been gallerists who offered artists that they met inside the Artist Academy solo exhibitions. They've taken them on to group exhibitions and there, have been, there has been so much opportunity. Now, Key, who's on this episode on the hotline today, is going to be one of the guests inside the Artist Academy for uh, this time around, for this round that's finishing up. And, you know, we might invite him back for the next round, which is opening uh, enrollment right now. Uh, but before we get into this episode, I also want to congratulate another artist uh, who is currently inside the Artist Academy. She sent me this amazing email. I'm going to read a bit of it to you right now. So I was a bit late to join last night because I had to finish up work, but I wanted to let you know that I just sold eight pieces of art in the last two weeks. 
I've been posting and manifesting and it's working. I can't thank you enough for this program, your wisdom and your guidance. It has been worth every single penny I spent. I have confidence to get out there. And this is so amazing to hear. Also, I got to tell you that the structure of this program is so cool. <laughs> you know, like I have done group programs online before where I've, I have participated and they're always like, well, surprise, we're going to meet at whatever time. But I make sure that whatever time we meet is best for is the best time so that the most people can join us in the Q&A's. Uh, so I always send out a survey before the course officially starts to all the people who are registered to ensure that they can be there during the Q&As. And if not all the Q&As, then most of them, right? And this is like a big thing that you have to do. I feel like you had, and I don't know any other course that does that. <laughs> so I just want you to know. And then... Um, the other really cool thing is that it really helps artists learn how to get their work out there. And I know that in this email, the artist is saying like, oh, I've been posting and manifesting. And it all sounds like just like whatever stuff. Here's the thing. Manifesting is all about adjusting the way that you think about things, which actually affects the way you feel about them and your feelings affect the way you act and ultimately affect the result. So that is why manifesting works because manifesting is about adjusting your thoughts to affect your feelings, which affects your actions and yields different results, right? So Speaking of results, <laughs> if you are interested in joining the Artist Academy, the program is open for early enrollment through March 10th. So what that means is you can get a special price if you register early. If you use the code early, you get 20% off, which is so exciting right? You have to use it by March 10th at midnight East, uh, at midnight Pacific. So use it by March 10th at midnight Pacific. And here's a bonus for you. If you tell me if you, after you register, if you respond to the email that you get, right, then after you register, you get a congratulations, you're in email, respond to that email and tell me that you heard this on the podcast because this is it. If you register during the early enrollment period and you're one of the first five people to register and send me this email that says, hey, I heard this on the podcast, you get a free one-to-one -one session with me right? So I don't do one-to-one -one sessions anymore. That is, so working with me on a one-to-one -one basis, this is really the only way to do it is if you register early and send me an email and you're one of the first five people to register and you tell me, hey, heard this on the podcast that I could get a free one-to-one -one session with you. And it would be a 45-minute one-to-one session dirt you know, that you can book pretty much any time as long as we're both available, right? Uh, while the program is happening, right? During those four months. So that has been really, really helpful to a lot of people. And I hope that you can take advantage of this offer. Now, let's dive into this conversation with Key Smith, who will be one of the guests inside the Artist Academy. And he has a very special announcement at the end, which all the links will be in the show notes. So I guess you can just tap on the show notes now and see what the announcement is. But if you listen to the end, um, it's kind of special because we make a special announcement that has to do with me and him at the end of the podcast. So tune in, enjoy, and please, if you like this podcast, 
leave us a five-star review so we can get this podcast out to more people. Thank Thank you. you so, so much for listening. Hi, Keith. Thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be on the podcast and chat a little bit about the gallery and and get to know things a little bit better. Absolutely. I can't believe, I feel like I first learned about your gallery when you were showing at spring break in maybe like 2019 and your gallery was up in Harlem and then I totally like kind of forgot about it and then I was walking around one day in my neighborhood in the East Village and I bumped into Keysmith Gallery and I was like wow this place looks really cool like it's awesome on the outside it's awesome on the inside and you know because you would paint like the front of the gallery to match the show inside which was Mm -hmm. awesome Mm -hmm. and then I came in and I was like oh wait okay wait I remember this gallery from spring break and ever since then I've really been I think like bringing I've been annoying you because I've been bringing in my group from Soho House my art walk group oh that's great (laughs) no that's been really really great and it's cool because you've really been able to see the evolution of the gallery I think that you know, one of the things that I put a premium on is growth and making sure that we continue to expand our program and get in, be in larger spaces, better locations. And so um, when you met us in 2019, we were up in Harlem and then 2020, we moved downtown to the East Village. 2021, I got a second location in the East Village. And then 2022, this past year, um, We closed both the East Village ones to move into a large space um, in the Lower East Side, a space with two floors. Yeah, yeah. And it is a beautiful space that you renovated yourself. True. This is, (laughs) I I, I would suggest this to nobody. (laughs) It's actually really funny because a lot of of friends of mine that have galleries and have galleries in the neighborhood and stuff like this um, actually had looked at this spot and looked at this place before and... I know at least three gallery owners in the neighborhood that have been here for a little while that took a look at this place and basically saw it and saw the condition it was in and um, and passed up on it. And I honestly, in the condition that it was originally in, I don't blame them. But when I saw this space, I had an immediate kind of like almost an emotional attachment to it because it's across the street from where I grew up. And I knew this place as the fish market. So to me, it was like really, it was in bad condition, but I knew exactly what it was. And and I knew that that space. Um, Cause even when I was a little kid, I used to be in the park and playing soccer and whatnot and stuff like this. And um, before they would turn on the fountains in the summer, when, when I would be playing and the fountains weren't on, I'd actually come over to the fish market to drink out of their hose. Oh, and so I knew, wow. I knew this place. <laughs> I knew this place very well. (laughs) So it was not only, okay, so it's also like a sentimental thing for you, which is so special. It's almost like reupholstering like the family chairs, you know, that are always there. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, exactly. And it is, it's like, I always kind of joke about it where it's like, I've seen my neighborhood change so much um, since growing up and and I, I've always wanted to, you know, we opened, I opened my first gallery with my brother in 2012, 2013, and that was a gallery in a nightclub in Brooklyn. And, um, and basically at that point, even then this neighborhood had already gotten to a place where it was kind of like inaccessible, not as affordable anymore, not, you know, harder to kind of like bootstrap open an art space and stuff like this. Um, and so I really did for the next 10 years kind of work very strategically trying to make the plays and build our program up to a place knowing that the goal is to be home to to kind of have that odyssey and have that that homecoming and stuff like this and um and I knew that as soon as that as soon as I was in my neighborhood I'd be able to expand our program in a way and reach out to um folks and kind of put the artists that we're working with in a position to really take things to the next level. And um, I've been incredibly grateful to like actually start experiencing that, which is really wonderful. Cause like we moved in 2020 um, down to a tiny, tiny location, kind of going from 1200 square feet down to 250. But that play was literally just 
to get one small foot into the neighborhood. And that was the little gallery on fourth and um, A. Yeah. And I knew that as soon as I'm in the neighborhood, then all of a sudden I'm going to be playing for the first time on home field, like on a, like home court advantage. Um, and so as I kind of like thought that that would, as that would happen, um, I was able to start expanding the program immediately and, and less than a year later, get a second location over on third street. Um, and then we've been able to expand again, 2022 into the new space. So I do, it's, it is kind of something interesting where as soon as you get into a place where you just have that built-in network and you, and you know, the people on your block and, um, and the East village is, and lower East side are both kind of interesting because obviously they've gone through a lot of change, but if you grew up here, there is still very much a neighborhood. Um, and people still do really look out for each other like a neighborhood. And, um, and I think that that's really special. Like one of the things that, um, really meant a lot to me was after the renovation, probably about a month ago, I was standing outside and, um, and I just started speaking to one of my neighbors that grew up in the building next door to me. And, um, and he's seen me as kind of familiar face in the neighborhood and vice versa for a while. And, and he turned to me and he said, it's like, he was like, Hey man, it's like, it's really cool to see, um, to see you open the gallery here and stuff like this. Cause he said, you never see someone from the neighborhood taking a storefront and, and um, kind of like taking one back to the neighborhood. And so that's, that's to me, it's like, you know, being here and being in this area um, comes with a lot of responsibility. I want to make sure that I, I can make my, my community proud and, um, and continue to expand and, and work with artists and kind of expand their careers. Cause I do really believe that the, success of any gallery program is the success of the artists that they work with. So we put kind of that growth of artists at a, at a premium. So one of the reasons why I even wanted to move to a larger location was because I was getting worried that even having two locations, the locations were both square footage wise under a thousand square feet each. And I have a theory that kind of like under a thousand square feet, there is a little bit of a cap of where you can push the values to and what you can attract into the space. And um, over a thousand square feet, really, I believe anything is possible. And there is no kind of like ceiling to, to what you can do with the folks that you work with. And so that's why I was very comfortable signing a 10 year lease over here and really um, knowing that we could have this as a flagship location and a place that we could really be building the, the careers of the artists we work with for the next decade. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful space. I, the first time I walked in, I was absolutely like taken aback by how stunning the installation was. It was totally museum quality. And you had an exhibition that had a lot of uh, mixed meat or digital work or like yeah. pixel based work. And it was so beautifully displayed because you hid all of, I mean, this is something that like I'm, I studied museology on the graduate level and I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like you can't see any of the chords and there's no sound bleed somehow. And like you did this and it, it's just so export and professional it looks so good. Yeah, that's, that's huge. That's huge credit to the, to the artist of that exhibition, Dylan Wright's Cruz. He's actually, um, He's an incredible artist that I started working with in 2019 at the gallery up in Harlem. But I actually know him um, from when I was about two years old. We went to preschool together on Avenue A. Um, oh, Avenue A in what? Avenue A in Second Street. So wow. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, he, and, that's yeah, awesome. And, so, yeah. and it was really cool like that. That was really amazing because he he was really able to bring all these kind of pieces to life in the way and, and he writes code for all of the different pieces. So there were different codes that um, controlled the movements and and would some of them would even actually um, react to your movement. So when you got closer to a piece, it would start kind of going faster and, and um, be activated in a sense like this. And yeah, I think that one of the things that I think about a lot is when when digital work and stuff and when kind of kinetic sculpture work is shown a lot of the time a little bit of the magic is lost when you kind of see this chord and stuff like this um so I worked with Dylan to kind of hide everything we we drilled through the walls we did things like this he had a lot of the pieces actually already programmed to be battery operated so I could just charge the battery you know once a week or something like this and 
Um, it wasn't sucking a lot of power because of the different codes that he was writing and whatnot. And so, yeah, he did really like spend a lot of time thinking about how to how to display the work and how to allow the the kind of magic of those pieces to exist, um, which was wonderful. And I thought that that was a really special exhibition to kind of start and kick the whole gallery off with. Um, and yeah, so that was that was a really exciting show. And, yeah. and more, more to come from Dylan. Keep your eyes peeled. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Now, I wanted to, since you mentioned preschool, I want to take you back and ask you, why did you start a gallery in the first place? Did you and like Dylan make a pact when you were three years old? And he was like, hey, no. I'm going to be an artist. <laughs> no, no it, was, it was crazy. Well, when, I, I would say this. I, I, um, I would say it's like two reasons, kind of, or two or three reasons. I, um, I grew up with my mother is an artist and her parents are artists. And um, her parents moved from Japan in the 50s to pursue their art careers. And so I grew up around art and um, I feel like a lot of folks kind of grow up with art as this kind of very weird and strange and other type of thing and, and this kind of like impractical career path in a way. And I grew up where that it was very normalized in a, in a strange way. It was, you know, my, my family uh, on my mother's side are all artists and even our neighbors growing up, their father was an artist. And um, so there was like a lot of arts communities that I would see growing up. And as crazy as this sounds, when I, uh, I we, we actually didn't, we didn't go to school till we were 12 years old. So that's already a little bit crazy. But then our neighbors didn't either. And their parents were also, uh, their father was also an artist. And so we kind of grew up just hanging out and always being around, um, my mom's studio, uh, his studio, uh, this artist, Matt Baumgartner. And, um, and then at a certain point, um, it you know, I actually, at a certain point we did go to school and I went to school and I got kicked out of school. And so then I was, I was 16 and my parents said I could either go get a job or go back to school. And I didn't want to go back to school. And as crazy as this sounds, I kind of thought, okay, well, here are the three, um, the three possible things that someone could be is artist, gallerist, or architect. Yeah. And these are <laughs> I the- I love this the, point of view. <laughs> yeah, this is the three possible career paths that one could go down. And, and it was kind of like artists being kind of like very kind of free and, and doing their own thing in a way like this architect being very like kind of rigid in a um in a system and art dealer or gallerist kind of being able to be business and and art um and so i actually went and walked into a gallery uh the storefront for art and architecture on kenmare in lafayette and started interning for them about three days after i got expelled from school oh wow and, okay i love this story so yeah. much because not only are you you are literally like knocking down all these myths that I'm so passionate about knocking down myself like yeah. um, the idea that it's an impractical thing to like be in the art world to begin with key I heard this you know first of all I grew up in Brooklyn but I moved there when I was seven years old from Kiev Ukraine Mm -hmm. And when we were in Kiev, my, I lived with my grandparents and my grandparents would always, uh, they were such patrons of the arts. I remember the smell of oil paint and like visiting art studios when I was like a really young kid. And I thought it was so amazing. And so when I was, when I realized that you could work in the art world and not be an artist <laughs> when I was like 12, Amazing. I was like, oh, this is exactly what I got to do. <laughs> and, you know, my grandparents being immigrants were thinking, oh, well, hey, this is so impractical. Like, how are you going to get a job? It's so competitive. Right. And he, I can't believe people say this because especially when you're in New York, and you look at how there's like literally thousands of galleries representing 20 to sometimes 70 artists, right? And yeah, it varies or more. And then you're like, wait a minute, this is totally possible. Yeah. 
And the, the other thing is you don't need a fancy like school education to intern anywhere and to do your thing. And you're doing it so well. <laughs> Like, you know, you know, you started interning a long time ago, but now you're like yeah. such a boss. So. No, it's fun. And I, and I did really think about that. Like I, I never got um, a GED or high school diploma and, um, and I was able to, I, I was somehow able to talk my way into college. I went for a year and a half. Um, wow. And I dropped out of that too. And okay, then, this literally means that you're like the best art dealer ever because yeah. you can talk your way into going to college without a high school diploma. That was pretty good. That was that was a good. That is negotiation that skills. That was like a good those one. are golden skills. Like yeah. you, could be, you could be um moonlighting at the FBI. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I am. So. Okay, you are. Um, um, yeah. No, but but it's it is really funny because then. You know, as I kind of, um, after I dropped out of college, I, I kind of realized like, you know, or one of the reasons why I dropped out is I thought about it and I was like, you know, I'm not, I don't see myself going into a career path where I want to be working for someone or have a boss. Um, and I want to be building my own thing. And I also, one of the things that I really saw in art school that was a huge inspiration for me starting my own gallery was I kind of thought about it. I was like, wow, here I am in a school and there's just in my grade, hundreds of talented artists. And, um, and then this is just one of hundreds of incredible schools in America that um, have art programs. And if you kind of think about it and do the math on it, it's like, wow. So literally thousands and thousands of incredibly talented artists are getting pumped out into the world and out of out of school or out of a program or out of a, even an MFA or whatever it is like this tossed out there and there are there are some but there's a lot less folks on a peer level and peer ages those artists that are there to receive them and there to um, show their peer talent and I think that um, I think that that's something that I've always really thought about is like it's important to have people in the art business that are ready to champion their peers, ready to champion folks that are in their same social circles, in their same communities and stuff like this. And so that's something that I've always been um, strived to do is to, is to like kind of make that relationship with artists. Because even a lot of the, the movements in art that I look up to, that a lot of them happening in New York and in, in, in the 60s and 70s, and then again in the 80s, um, a few different scenes. and in those scenes, you did really see a lot more peer representation, like folks that weren't that much older than the folks that they were representing at the time building programs. And I think that, you know, people in the, um, I guess like 60s, 70s kind of type of scenes like that, that I would, I would look up to in that sense is um, folks like Dick Bellamy, who had the Green Gallery and, um, or people like Paula Cooper, who, um, I mean, she still has an incredibly active program, but she got started when um, when she was quite young and showing artists that were not that much different in age from her. And um, and then even folks like on the West Coast, like uh, Virginia Dwan was was showing a lot of the uh, folks and she was big in kind of making the land art movement happen. And then um, and then even people like Walter Hopps, uh, who later became the chief advisor of Dia's collection, I think, for the Demon Eels. And, um, but he had his first gallery, I think Ferris Gallery, and, and they were showing a lot of people that were in their peer circles and stuff like this. And not, it wasn't so much like older galleries showing um, younger artists or older artists and stuff like this. It was a lot of folks with a lot of energy kind of showing what they thought was exciting. And I think that you know, these are these are kind of folks that I always look up to. And um, and then you see that again in the in the 80s scene um, with a lot of galleries opening up in the East Village and um, like the Fun Gallery and all types of things like this. These are these are all places that um, were showing people that were in their social circles at the time. And, and you know, and even nightclubs and stuff like this that were, you know, it wasn't uncommon to see different musicians and um, and artists all in the same kind of social circles at the same nightclubs, hanging out, doing things, making things happen. And um, and I think that those are both time two kind of like times in art that I always look up to. Um, and always, you know, 
not emulate in a copying way, but emulate in the sense that you do want to be um, championing the folks that are around you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's all about community. But yeah. that said, here's a question for yeah. you. I mean, I have two burning questions. Oh, great. One is what, you know, and I want to say this in, in a way that uh, uh, acknowledges how much you actually do for artists. So this is why I'm asking because I want to hear all the cool things you're doing. But, you know, nowadays the art world is, a, it, the landscape of it shifted so much because we're on the internet, right? And all of a sudden there are artists who might be selling on their own or they might be thinking like, hey, I don't know if I need a gallery, uh, but I want to know what does a gallery do for an artist, right? I, but just yeah. with that question, I have to tell you that the majority of artists that I work with that I hear from, they all want to show with a gallery, especially one in New York City, but I want to hear it from you. What is the benefit of working with a gallery? I think there's there's definitely a few different benefits that I can think of. Um, I think that actually one of one of the reasons why I thought that it would be really interesting to start a gallery is because if you think about about artists and the kind of barriers that um, are in place to keep them from really succeeding and stuff like this, it's like the first barrier is kind of like gallery and gallery representation and people put such a premium on like oh well as soon as I'm a represented artist then everything's great like but and so it's like and I was like wait a second so gallery is just a um that the the only barrier there is you just need to go and like make things happen and have a storefront and have things going on so it's like I can achieve that we can make that happen and then kind of the next barrier up is museums and then kind of like getting into those collections and stuff like this but if you think about it there's only really two barriers in place from artists just in their studio hanging out doing things and like little random things and pop-ups and stuff around to really having quite fruitful careers and i think that i think that in a best case scenario a gallery is a place where that can promote an artist's career and work closely with an artist over many years and over decades hopefully and i think that galleries can kind of be a place that well one one a couple things Typically, galleries will go and take on logistically um, spaces in a lot better neighborhoods and neighborhoods that are kind of uh, more heavily saturated with clients. And so it's taking on larger commercial leases and kind of taking on more risk in that sense to allow the artist to have the opportunity to be in front of those eyes for a period of time. So I think that any artist can make incredible works doesn't matter where their studio is it could be anywhere in the world a studio is enough to allow the quality of the works to be wherever the artist wants to take them mm -hmm. and then i think that i i think in a lot of senses um if the works kind of stay in the studio and don't have the opportunity to kind of see the light of day then it's kind of like the tree in the forest that falls and did anyone hear it and um, and I think that there are definitely things like social media that allow artists to have that accessibility to clients and to larger networks. And I think by and large, that's an incredibly positive thing. So it's not like the gallery is now the only point of contact allowing the artist's career to kind of like be shown into the world. So there can be a lot of ways and relationships that can use cross promotion and that all of a sudden the gallery and the artist can kind of come together and make one larger, stronger list of clients and one larger, stronger kind of like list of um, outlets to kind of promote the work to. And so I think that a gallery in its best scenario is a is a company that can work with an artist to promote their career and help allow more legitimacy to kind of come onto their career and for them to be seen in in really positive light. So I think that something that I always look for with artists and stuff like this is first the artist has to have confidence in themselves. If they can have confidence in themselves and confidence in their work and they have the ambition to want to take things further, then I can take that leap of faith and be the second person to go and um, put confidence in their career and, and start working with them and trying to champion that. And then I think it's a little bit like, um, I feel like there was like a, a TED talk about this at one point where it was like how movements and stuff start, where it's like one person can start something 
but it, that second person going and um, starting to dance next to that person like this, then that's what starts that the rest of everyone wanting to be part of that. And so it's kind of like that first person needs the courage to go and make things happen. And then the gallery can be that second person that can go and start making a larger ripple effect and allow it to be seen to um, wider demographics. So I, you know, this is such a beautiful statement and it's so much about energetics as well, because yeah. confidence is truly the one thing that aligns you with what you're doing, right? Like, yeah. or it makes it easy for you to do what you're doing because there's a whole like line of confidence. For example, the collector has confidence in you that you yeah. are giving them and or presenting the best artists that you can and that you can find, right? Then you're scouring the world for them and they're all at Keysmith Gallery. And then you have confidence in the artist. So the, mm -hmm. the starting point of confidence is with the artist Absolutely. him or herself or themselves. Absolutely. So that is so, so powerful. Wow. Okay. That's Yeah, that's, I think, first and foremost, that's really, really important. And then it's also really trying to think of, like, art is a long game. And that's why, like, even when we got this new space, I signed a 10-year lease. I asked for 20 years, and they said, uh, that's too crazy in this day and age. So we did 10. Um, but then I really think about it because it's like, I, you know, the folks, a lot of the folks that we're showing now and will be showing into the future in a best case scenario, I will continue relationships with these folks because it's always easier to kind of like build off of momentum that's already been created. And I think that it's like, I don't want to be one of the galleries that kind of like churns things in and out and goes works works with this then throws it out next, 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 and just work with a few, you know, thousand artists or, or something like this. and. Um, and yeah. their whole point, you know, it's just less, it's less interesting because I do think actually this, with a gallery and the relationship with gallery and artists, where it gets really um, kind of wonderful and where you get to see the fruits of your labor is not in the first show. It's not in even sometimes the second show. It's in the third or fourth show where you actually start to know this person and know their body of work and know their practice in a way where you can really encourage them to take things to places and make risks and take risks to bring their their kind of like ideas of what is possible um, and elevate them. Yeah. So I think that that's like, that's really exciting to kind of like think of things in a long game. And, and I also think a little bit about the gallery just in general. Um, and I think this is probably a little bit atypical of galleries, but I, I see it a little bit almost like a sports franchise. And as the gallery, you're the GM. And so the okay, artists this the is you're wearing a, a Knicks, um, oh, Knicks, Knicks yeah. shout, out the, shout out New York Knicks. I'm a season yeah. ticket holder. I love the Knicks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going right. to win in my lifetime. <laughs> they, will. Um, they will. We will All win right. in my lifetime. And then the, but I do really think about it like that because like, if you think about even that as an analogy, like it is it's never good for teams to kind of like throw out all of their players and trade them all away and just, and rebuild everything like this. You want to be building a team where you have these pillars on your team that can be incredible players for year after year after year. And, and even shepherd folks that you bring into your program. And so I think that having that kind of community around the artists is something that I also really put a premium on. So a lot of the, a lot of the artists that I work with, organically have become friends and organically go to studio visits with each other now that they're both you know now that they're part of this community and I think that that's really exciting because like you know me going on a studio visit at an artist that's great and that's that's fun and that's awesome and I, I enjoy doing that and stuff like this but also artists going to studio visits with with each other and, and you know going and seeing a peer studio because I'll even say there are times when some of the artists I work with I'll go to their studio and I'll say hey Go visit, you know, her studio or something like this and get, get, get you know, get her thoughts on this or like, or encourage yeah. her to do this or something like this. Because I think a lot of the times when it comes from another artist, it doesn't seem so overbearing. And I never want to like, kind of like be yeah. overbearing in that sense. You don't want to kind of like, you want to be able to nudge people in the right direction to make sure that you're kind of directing their careers in the best way possible and sometimes that's through 
a friend and, and, a, and a peer of theirs, you know, another mm-hmm. artist that shows at the gallery. And sometimes that is through me. I'm, I'm never hesitant to just say what's on my mind too, to artists and whatnot. But, um, but I do think that, you know, having that community of artists and, and inviting artists into that community is really exciting. And I think that, you know, there's, there are artists that I work with now that have organically kind of, I started showing just by basically them coming into that community. So it wasn't even approaching me. It was, you know, a great example is the artist Luke Ivy Price, who we just had a huge solo show with. Um, he originally had a studio at Mana Contemporary where we had our, um, my first gallery, the last iteration of my first gallery, um, Apostrophe NYC, had a space out at Mana. And all 12 of the artists that we were representing at the time were had studios out there. And Luke also just happened to have a studio out there. And he kind of became friends with a few of the artists that we were showing at the time. And through organically building those friendships, he was, um, I was introduced to him, but introduced to him in a way where it was like, oh, this is one of my, you know, one of my friends that also has a studio there like this. So it was very kind of like organic in that sense. And, um, and then, you know, now I've been working with him since 2000. Uh, I've known him since 2017 and been showing his work since 2019. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, that's wonderful kind of like example of like communities kind of growing and building your community. And yeah. now you're not the only agent building your community. There are so many artists that are also building that community. And that's really special. So, Key, okay, I wanted to ask you this before I ask my like other burning question for you. Yeah. But... Um, you know, you said earlier that it's so it, like an artist studio could literally be anywhere in the world. Yeah. And when you're, I am asking you this question for the artists who are out there who really want to work with a gallery that's in New York or LA yeah. or some Paris maybe or London, yeah. but they live in a rural part of the United States or Canada or somewhere that's kind of remote or maybe even Australia. Like, what do you say to those artists? I would say a couple things. I would say first, first and foremost, it's really important to try to, um, even if it's a very small scene in the local town or, or wherever you are, try to start making waves and making moves locally and kind of making a splash locally. And then when you feel that momentum, I always think it's wonderful to to go and be in the in a city like New York is a huge step and I think can be a huge step for an artist. So I think that an, an example that I kind of like can see right away is um, one of the artists that we've worked with now since 2015. I've known him since 2012 um, and we haven't, we didn't really start showing his work a lot until 2017 or so with my other gallery. But one of the things that I saw was here was this artist and he wasn't in New York and he didn't, he didn't live in New York and he'd come down sometimes on the weekends or sometimes from time to time, once a month or something, be a little bit like poking around and whatnot. But he really did put it on himself to really conquer a scene. And he was living in Burlington, Vermont. And, um, and in probably about three to four years, he'd kind of reached the absolute pinnacle of of that scene and in that sense I mean kind of like okay he an example of that is in those years that he was really kind of like working hard on the local scene that he was part of he ended up with the commission at the Burlington airport he did the mural at the largest beer company in Burlington he had you know his works on the on the cans of the beer he had he was showing at one of the best galleries there and stuff like this all through just hard work and kind of making connections and making local connections even if they weren't on a massively high level and then in 2016 I said hey Charlie you know you're an incredibly talented guy I think you've really like you've done what you can do in in where you are and I said it's going to be a big leap of faith and New York's a really expensive and crazy place. Um, But I said, you know, I've really seen you work incredibly hard over the last like three, four years building up your name in your local scene. And um, I said, why don't I make a deal with you and you need to move to New York? And he was like, 
I can't, I don't have the money to move to New York right now. And I said, cool, I'm going to set it up. You can live with this. I found a place that's very cheap. Um, and I'm going to buy a painting from you right now to help with your moving costs and whatnot and come to New York and take that leap of faith and know that you've already built yourself up locally to a place where, look, worst case scenario, move to, back to Vermont. You're still the, you're still the mayor out there. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> but go take this leap of faith to be in this bigger pool, because I do think that, you know, first is conquering the local and then. I think the next step for a lot of folks really is getting into a larger pool and and knowing that when you dive in there, I told Charlie this, I said, you're going to be the tiniest fish in the biggest pool when you first dive in. But I know that you're the type of person that I've seen it because I've seen it in the small pool happen like this. You will grow. And when you grow yourself organically again in this city, you will now reach places that you'd never imagined were possible up there. Um, so I think, you know, I would say to all folks in anywhere they are, you know, whether it's even even someone like Luke Ivy Price, who was uh, grew up in rural, rural um, North Carolina, where there was really no art scene to speak of. He did. He conquered what he could there. He was on the <laughs> he was on the board of the local arts council. He was showing in some different like local, you know, kind of like um, spots and museums and different places like this. He had won all the awards of the, you know, the town art art awards and stuff like this he had he had conquered that scene and then and then again it was taking a leap of faith he quit his job at the cotton mill and got in a car and drove up to new york with basically i think a thousand dollars that he had saved up from work and no place to even stay no place to even know what was going on and i think you know for the first few months he was literally homeless in the city just with the dream and I think that, you know, and then he started meeting folks to allow himself to start getting into more artistic communities and stuff like this and picking up some different jobs around here and there. And um, and then that landed him in the studio at MANA, which landed him, uh, you know, meeting us. And fast forward, probably this, you know, everything takes time again. So, you know, fast forward, I would say almost six or seven years. Now he's done three solo shows. He lives in Battery Park. He has a studio he's moving into in the East Village. We sold a ton of the works from the last exhibition. Um, he's represented by a gallery in the Lower East Side and uh, for, by- Living the dream. Was truly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Living and the dream. Living the dream. But I really think that it it takes that leap of faith to go and, and just, Get in, your, get in a car, some weird beater car that he had like this and drive up to New York without any kind of like immediate plans or immediate shows lined yeah. up or anything like this. And that dedication, that's something that I'll look for all day long. Like hearing that story, I was like, yeah, that's it, let's go. Cause this is someone that will take himself and put himself through whatever it needs to happen to make that dream and make that success possible. And so you want to be with folks and surrounding your folks that want to win. It's like, it's hard to win a championship. And I think that, you know, you need folks that are willing to year after year um, be resilient. And I think that that's something that I really think about in the arts that's really important. It's resilience. And, um, and that's something that, you know, you it's hard to see immediate, um, effects or reactions from actions that you're taking right now in the arts, things all have happened slowly. And so it's like things and moves that I'm making now, I'm looking forward to seeing the fruits of those in two or three years. And I think having that, knowing that, okay, if that means that I go pick up some random job here to go bring in a little liquidity so I can keep on building, I know that at a certain point, the work that I'm putting in now is gonna hit that corner and turn that corner and make things happen. And having that kind of belief in yourself and having that, you have to kind of have an appetite for risk in a way, because you do have to be almost a little bit crazy to think like, you know, that's it. I'm moving up. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go and, and I'm going to just start selling, selling sculptures or selling paintings or whatever it is like this. And, and I'm going to be, um, you know, a, a successful artist. Cause I think, you know, it is a lot like athletes in that sense. There's lots and lots, there's, thousands of folks that grow up playing sports and um and then it's really the folks that are incredibly dedicated that are able to eventually make 
big professional teams and stuff like this. And those folks have really, you know, by and large dedicated their whole life to, to doing that. And so when I see that type of dedication in someone, yeah, that makes me want to pick them up. And you want him, you, you want that person to be like your Patrick Ewing, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. You want to draft them. You want to draft them. You want to draft them. Um, exactly. I love that. And now he, here's the other burning question. Yeah. And I know that a lot of the artists listening to this podcast already kind of have an idea but I wanted to ask you, you know, how do you go about finding artists and do you ever find artists on social media? Because like, let's say someone's like the star of their town, but it is in New Zealand and they can't get to New York on a regular basis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. So I think that one of the things that I always say with with finding artists and and this is, I think, kind of exciting. It's it's and this is really the honest truth is. Um, I'm always looking for artists and I'm never looking for artists. So it's kind of like one of these things where it's like, you can never be in a space in your program where like, I don't know enough people to show or there's not enough talent around. That's impossible in New York. But when you see someone and react to their work and, and kind of like make that connection, you're ready to pick them up and you, you're ready to have space in your program to make that happen. And so I think that it's, you know, an example of, even someone that is international that we're about to go and, and pick up and that I'm very excited about is um, someone that is a parent at the school that um, actually expelled me, called me up a few weeks ago and she said, oh, you know, here's the, there's this artist that, um, that I know that I, I just bought a piece of and, and I'm really, really excited about. And, and people call with this type of situation all the time. Yeah. And I, I said, you know what, of course I'll, I'll give the time of day and I'll check it out and stuff like this. And I actually really responded to the work and I, I thought it was really, really cool. And, and I said, you know what? And she said, she's actually going to be in New York. She's living in Australia, but she's going to be in New York. And um, I'd love to introduce you. And I said, okay, great. You'll just tell her to come by the gallery. And, and I had a long chat with her at the gallery and we spoke a lot and, and she actually had gone to the school I went to, but was a few years younger so we never overlapped at that school and we um we connected i really liked the work and she has a show coming up in australia in um may and so again she's conquering that scene over there organically on her own like this and she's yet to have a big solo show in new york and i said hey look you know, if you're willing to take this, I, I got on a call for, it was like probably a two hour conversation after we had already met and spoke for thousands of hours. Um, and I, and I said, look, if, if you're down and you're really willing to take this leap and go and start allocating, you know, a good section of your year in New York and make things happen and start having a presence in this, in this city, I'm, I'd be uh, more than happy to and honored to be the to be um, the gallery on their side that can help make that happen, help facilitate that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, yeah, she's showing. She's going to show of us um, in about eight months this fall. She we're having a big solo show of her and um, starting to plan that out now. She's moving to New York for it in June, so she has time to to work and get a studio and get a studio practice there and start integrating herself into um, the New York community and stuff like this. Uh, she's already started putting feelers out for studios and stuff like this. I put some feelers out for her as well. And, um, and yeah, it's kind of like her taking that leap of faith to want to jump into New York and just go and dive all the way in and just say, okay, you know what, I'm going to make it happen. And I'm going to go and, you know, I have this show in May. I'm going to hopefully have, you know, a little chunk of change to, from that show. And I'm just going to go and move to New York and make that this all happen. Let's wow. go. Yeah. Let's go. So it's like, I'm always, when I see that type of motivation and that, that person that has been really working and making things happen and in the place that they've been, they, where they've been, mm -hmm. um, if I see that dedication and also respond to the work and personally kind of like have that connection to the works and, um, and to their practice, then I'm ready to go. And so, you know, that's, that's um, in DV Sutton and she'll be showing with us this fall. And I'm really excited about that. And that's a really good example of someone that is international. And um, she did grow up in New York, but then moved to Australia and has lived there for quite some time now. And, um, but that's an example of someone that, that did like had real no intentions of moving to New York, 
Um, and I said, you know, if you take the leap of faith, I'll take the leap of faith in showing you. And, and we had that kind of, we were ready to go and jump in and dive in together. And, um, and then I'm excited to kind of like continue growing that relationship, right? Not just one time for the one time in exhibition. I said that I'll only have a solo show off the bat with you because I rarely do that with an artist. Um, I rarely, rarely do that. Like bring yeah. them into that type of situation there. I was comfortable doing that because I knew some of the network that she has in New York and stuff like this and was already kind of like, there was already a little bit of crossover there. And I said, as long as you're willing to allow this to be a relationship and, and think of this as a relationship that we can work with for many, many years and stuff like this and, and have follow-up exhibitions together and stuff like this, I'm willing to go and take that leap of faith and put you in um, and start you right away. Cause it like back to the kind of like sports analogy, that's picking a player up and, and putting her, her on the starting lineup right away, um, which I typically don't do. Like uh, the more typical way that I'll bring an artist into the program is I'll have them in, in a group show, I'll have them in a pop-up, I'll have them in a couple different settings um, before I put them into that starting mm -hmm. line. So right. I'll have them kind of like through the, through the training ranks and right. on the bench for, for, you know, a season and then bring them into the, um, into a starting place. But then it is, yeah. But because she had, you know, already kind of like a network that she created in New York, you felt comfortable giving her a solo show. And on top of that, she was awesome. So that's And cool. on top of that, she had really, she's done incredibly well for herself in yeah. her local scene in Sydney. Yeah. So she's showing with a very, she's gotten a very good gallery representation in Sydney. Um, she's really built her market up there. And so she kind of really checked the boxes of like, you know, it's at that point, it's almost like taking her on loan from another team or taking her from yeah. another team, then picking her out from, from um, a draft or something like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like, um, but okay. So anyway, I'm bad at these sports analogies. Hey, but, I don't um, know why I keep on making them. <laughs> but no, no, no. I like them so much. They're so on brand. And also I you know side note I just watched Flash Gordon last night do you Maybe. remember that movie I do remember the movie I haven't seen it I, in a thousand years I but I you have to watch it as an adult it's yeah see because I'm I'm sure you watched it like I did on channel 11 yeah 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 <laughs> you know and it's so crazy because in the movie you know Flash Gordon is um a football player mm -hmm. and he emphasizes the benefit of teaming up and <laughs> It's just, yeah. like, it's so good. You have to watch that. No, it absolutely is true. And I, I think that that's something that is really, really important. And, and back to more sports analogies, that's why I do really think about the roster that I have and the stable of artists that I have as a team. And they think of each other as a team. And so it's like, and when you have that team support, that's so much, that's, that's something that as the gallery, I'm not even going to go and take full responsibility for because that's also a lot of the other players making yeah. that happen. But that's something that I think is really special about having having um, a gallery that has that around them. And I think that like, you know, being part of a larger community of artists is the best thing an, an artist could do for their career. Oh, I love that. Now, um, I wanted to ask you uh, about anything that's coming up in the gallery for you that you wanted to tell us about. I, I would love to share a, an incredibly exciting opportunity that I have um, and, and, and listen up all the, all the artists out there listening to the podcast. I do want to, this is something I've, I've actually never done before. I've been always kind of like a little bit opposed to open call exhibitions and stuff like this. I always think that typically those exhibitions end up not putting a lot of emphasis on the artists that they end up showing. And, um, and then, you know, there typically is, and it makes sense to have an application fee. So you can allocate the time to really look through and sift through things and stuff like this. But, you know, a lot of times these shows have an application fee and then it can feel like it kind of went nowhere and just kind of got poofed into the wind. Um, so that's, these are a lot of the, my reservations on ever doing this. Um, but I did really start realizing, you know, I started feeling actually really bad about a lot of the emails that I would get each week that were artists kind of saying, hey, check out the portfolio. I'd love to like, you know, speak about potentially collaborating in the future. And that's an email that's really cool and really exciting. And, and I feel like, and I, I felt really bad that I wouldn't 
respond to a lot of those because I didn't have any immediate spaces in our calendar where I could go and allow that to happen or, you know, be able to actually legitimately start a conversation about, about working with someone. And so I actually decided to make some space in our calendar and take a, take a month to go and have an exhibition and have a group show. And it's not going to be a massive group show of, of, you know, even over 10 artists, it'll be probably a fairly pared down show around um, somewhere between five and 10 artists or something like that. And really allow each artist to have a little bit of dedicated space in the gallery where they can show at least three works or something where, where someone that comes into the gallery can really get a sense of their practice and who they are as an artist. Um, so we are taking applications for the first time ever. If you wow. go to the website, um, yeah, if you go to the website, right on the homepage, you'll see apply. It'll say a little bit more about the exhibition. And here are two things that I'm doing for everyone that applies, um, because I really am very, very moved by the folks that do apply and, and take the time to go and, and upload their CVs and upload images and, and fill out the application and, um, and everything like this. And I think that, you know, that means a lot to me. And so I want to make sure that um, I can reciprocate in any way that I can. Um, and so everyone that applies, I'll be inviting to a special kind of private reception where they'll get to meet all of the judges that we're gonna announce very soon in March, we're gonna announce the judges. Um, and that's gonna be really exciting. And I think that, you know, and that'll give them an opportunity to meet these folks. And the judges that I'm choosing for the, for the um, exhibition will all be folks that work in the arts. And some of them actually that have already confirmed own galleries, some are advisors, some are curators. Um, everyone that we're gonna have plays a role in working with artists. And that means to me that when I have everyone that's applied into the space and to go and have this reception and go meet and network, not only can they go and network with the other artists that are applying, but they can also network with these folks that are going to be the judges and they can, you know, go make an impression on folks and stuff like this, but also make organic relationships with some of these people. Because if let's say only, only 10 people might get the opportunity to be in this show, but I think a lot more than 10 can actually be big winners because they can make organic relationships with, with the folks that we'll be introducing them to. And a lot of those folks are in positions to place them into other exhibitions and to place them into their galleries and stuff like this. So I think that, you know, that's something that I'm really excited to be doing and having as part of this open call program. And then another thing is I've decided, and this is also very atypical of, of open calls and stuff like this. I've decided to give everyone that applies a dedicated shout out on our Instagram. Um, so we're going to have an Instagram story and I'm going to post my favorite of the five different images that they've put up. So I'll go and shout everyone out. And that's just kind of my way of my little salute back to them and thanking them to, for applying and, um, and allowing, their, allowing my network and, and my following and stuff like this to also see their work. And so I think that, you know, that's really exciting. And that also makes me kind of feel better about having an open call and feel better about actually taking the time to try to make legitimate um, connections and relationships with artists. And so, I'm really excited about this exhibition. We've already gotten a few applications and I'm really excited to get some more. And um, and I think they're from, I haven't officially gone through anything because I don't want to start preemptively going through pieces and you know making judgments before I see everyone. Um, but I peek from time to time and I'm really excited about what we've seen so far. And um, I think it's going to be an incredible exhibition and I'm really excited to, hopefully make some real la long lasting relationships with some of these artists, you know, bring them on in this group show setting and kind of seeing how they perform in that setting and, um, you know, how, how each person goes and takes that opportunity of having, having um, a place on the team for a moment. And I think that that's going to be really exciting. So, you know, this is uh, the first time we're doing it. And I feel like it will be an organic way for us, another avenue for us to kind of link with artists and connect ourselves to larger networks of artists. And yeah, I'm excited for that. I'm excited for uh, the next, I'm really excited for the exhibition. I think it'll be great. I think it's going to be awesome. I feel like uh, it sounds like it's like the tryouts for the team. <laughs> this is the trash. This is the summer league. This is the summer league. This like, is the 
but someone is going to make it onto the team. Someone's okay. going to make it onto the team. I know it. I know yeah. it. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, okay. I have to ask you, like, do you have, um, sports brand, like sports branded, like merchandise for your team, for your gallery, like with logos and everything. Cause that we would have not, but we're yeah, coming soon to a gallery near you. Yeah. yeah I want to, I, I, I would love to make some, make some, uh, make some merch and stuff like this. Um, yeah, that'd be really, really fun. We did that with my old gallery had some merch like this and we had, um, we had one of the shirts that kind of like looked like a soccer jersey and stuff like this. I, I'm gonna make some cool merch. I'm 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 gonna work. I'm on so that. into it. Like I, think really cool. I want some. It'd be awesome and it'd be hilarious if like yeah. you, like little it, uniforms. <laughs> I want the uniforms. I want the uniforms. Yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready for that. I'm here for that. Oh my gosh. And, and the track suits, this, the jumpsuits. Wait, Kim, what if you like um always went to work with a whistle around your neck? I'm ready. I'm there Kim, for that. Because you're like the, the director coach. Of the coach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Wow. Um, so thank you so much for answering all these amazing questions. This is so cool that you're like doing this so hands-on so in person sort of I think one of the things that I learned about you recently was that you're more of a caller than an emailer yes. <laughs> like you which is so unusual for like our generation right everyone's like I have sure. to text people and that's it and I was like wow I literally have not heard hey call me recently oh, I always say call me I'm like if like email I don't know maybe we'll get lost maybe with this this I might see I might not call me I'm there I'm there for it I sometimes someone's it. texting me and they and I just see the message is so long I gotta call this is crazy <laughs> gotta, yeah you're like I don't I can't I gotta get on the phone um I so it. I really like that you're like so analog about it and it you know this is uh, a testament to how organic all of the relationships are that you've built and the most long-lasting relationships are the organic ones so absolutely yeah and then also in in regards to we could take a moment for to to preemptively announce one of the judges here uh for <laughs> okay. for, for, for yeah. the for the open call exhibition that we're going to be doing at Keysmith gallery i'll i'll, I'll let you take it away because we, we oh. can have a little the special the special this is the first first one announcement on the podcast let's okay, do it live let's right. do it it's live. like an easter egg it's like you know you have to like search for who the judges are and you're gonna hear about who one of the judges is uh on this podcast right now right and now. it is yours truly hey Yay! that's so exciting i'm really excited <laughs> When, when I called you the other day and, and asked you if you'd want to be one of the judges, um, and when you said yes, I was so, I was so happy and so excited. Oh, Kia, like that. when you asked me, I was like, this is so cool. Of course, absolutely, oh, no brainer. Thank so thank you. I'm so, so honored, truly. This is awesome. Thank you. No, I'm really, really excited. And so, and this is the, you know, this is the, the ilk of the incredible quality of judges that we will have. Um, so this is amazing. And it's like, and it's great because folks that, you know, folks that know the artist advisor can go and know that she'll be one of the folks that's reviewing. She'll be one of the folks that's trying to pick some champions. And, um, so you'll have someone in your corner already. And that's great. And I think that that's really exciting because yeah. every judge that we're, we're picking, um, will be picking some artists that they want to be kind of, um, putting to the top of the lists. And I'll make sure to have a minimum of at least one artist that each judge wants to put up into that show. So she'll be picking a minimum of one, right. if not four. <laughs> okay. All right. No pressure on me, but no pressure. <laughs> I really, I can't wait to go through these open calls. I've been, I mean, it's just so fun. I think one of my favorite things ever about working in the art world was meeting artists, going to studios hanging out with artists. That was like my favorite thing. And I am, I feel so lucky that I get to go through some open calls occasionally. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I'm really excited. And I think it'll be really fun that the reception that we're going to do, and I'm going to do this reception before anyone makes any definitive calls on, on who's going to be in the exhibition. Ooh. It's be really <laughs> exciting. Everyone gets to go and like, <laughs> 
go and meet crazy. everyone first and, and get to see the gallery, get to see, yeah. get to see the space and kind of start understanding the space and understanding some of the folks that are going to be reviewing the applications and stuff like this. And, um, and I'm really excited for that event. So that's, a, that's an event that everyone will get to be, uh, me if you haven't and, and, uh, and Marina, and that's going to be, and, and a couple of other incredible, incredible judges. So that's going to be really exciting. Oh, wow. So cool. Awesome. I want to make like such a corny joke, but I guess if you're all here, let me do it. I feel just like RBG. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's true. But, um, but, you know, I think I, I have this thing where I like, don't let any conversation slide without saying like, hey, did you know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg and I went to the same school? <laughs> Hey, did, hey. We did. We went to the same K through eight school. And when I met her, I told her this and she looked at me and she goes, not at the same time. Ooh. And I'm like, wow, that is logic. That is why we have you on the Supreme Court. A very logical answer. That is an incredibly <laughs> logical answer. Yeah, we went to the same school, but not at the same time. I don't know you like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know you like that. I don't know you like that. Huh? That's great. I love that. Oh, that's really fun. All right. On that note, I guess I'll, note. I'll see you all at the reception. I'll see you all at the reception. That's right. <laughs> Key, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Support your community by sharing this podcast, leaving a review, and follow The Artist Advisory on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore advisory. And visit us online at www.theartistadvisory.com.